All right, so this presentation is one I actually give to my research students every couple of years. And the, the, the full presentation is called Life Cycle of a Research Project. And so we go through everything from idea to experiment to results to publishing and then go back to the start to an idea again and complete the cycle as many times as you can before you graduate. And so today I'm not going to talk to you about all of this. I'm only going to talk to you about this publications portion of it. And so arguably this is the most important portion of the research that we do. As wisely put by George Whitesides, sides, interesting and unpublished is equivalent to non-existent. And that's a very true thing. You can have the best ideas in the world. You can run the best experiments in the world. Uh, but if you do not publish those results, they may as well not exist. And I'm sure there's a lot of discoveries that are sitting on a shelf somewhere that just weren't published and didn't help society as a whole. And so it is really important that we get our publications out. And so again, I'm happy to talk to you guys about writing a paper. One thing I will note is a lot of the advice here is things that I do with my students and my research group. Uh, whatever group you don't join, whatever flavor of research you do, obviously these will vary, but uh, hopefully you'll get some general insights into what might be useful in the process of writing a paper. All right. So many of you have heard the phrase publish or perish. That is a very real thing, especially in academia, papers matter. But not just that, when you guys apply for jobs, if you're going to industry, papers matter, your CV matters. In fact, I was really surprised to learn that when most of my graduate students apply for industry jobs, no one asks for a letter of recommendation. In academia, letters of recommendation are everything. In industry, it turns out they care a lot about CVs and the school, uh, tool set you have and the results that you have published. And so publish or perish is something de definitely relevant to you, not only for getting a job, but you literally need a paper to graduate. It's one of our criteria at FSU for you to graduate is you have to have published at least one paper of your individual research with you as the first author. Yeah. Um, one thing to note about writing papers, it's very easy to get caught up in this trend of, I just need one more experiment, one more result, and then I'll start writing. You can't wait for that to happen. <laughs> Do not wait until you're done with experiments to start writing, because the reality is you're never going to be done with experiments. And so really your writing should guide the experiments more than the other way around. And so as soon as you have a publishable result, your first instinct should be, I need to start writing a paper and I need to get this paper out the door. And as soon as you have it in a template, all of a sudden it becomes very real and the motivation starts to ratchet up. And so the earlier you can start writing a paper, the more productive you're going to be, the, the quicker you're going to get that paper out the door. And so um, usually when I give this talk, it's about, I don't know, probably three separate one hour sessions to give the entire talk, but I've cut it down quite a bit just to focus on just the paper writing aspect of it. And so here's the outline I'll cover. Hopefully I'll get through most of this in the next 45 minutes to an hour, but Step one, picking a journal, outlining the papers, figure tables, graphs, captions, finally writing the paper, then submitting reviews and proofs. It's a relatively simple process, and you're going to do this over and over again when you're writing research papers, but there's some details along the way that are worth learning. So let's start in step one, uh, picking a journal. And so this is one of the things before anyone in my group starts writing, we figure out what journal we're actually writing for. And so we do that for a couple reasons. The first reason is we want to make sure the research fits the audience that we're going after, right? We want the right people to see it. Um, and we can figure that out based on the, 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 what other papers are published in the journal, um, as well as the typical audience for that journal, but also the journal guidelines. And so if you go to like a journal website, they'll say something like about us or about the journal, and they'll give you a description that tells you exactly who the audience is. It'll tell you exactly what research they're interested in. And so here's ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces, a community of chemists, engineers, physicists, blah, 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 focused on the interfaces. Um, uh, we Journal scope is this, and it literally lists everything. And so if you go to chemical biology, it's going to give you something very different. It's at the interface of chemistry and biology. We welcome mechanistic studies of protein nucleic acids. So they literally tell you what their topic is, and you can decide whether your writing or your results are appropriate for those journals. Other things to consider is impact factor. Um, obviously, you want to go as high of impact factor journal as you can, but sometimes you don't want to waste time and just get the paper out there. So cost benefit analysis. Uh, one thing that I like to think about with my group, especially students that have, you know, two or three papers coming out, is to make sure they're not publishing in the same journal over and over again. It's just to diversify your CV, also diversify the audience that's going to see your paper. And so in this case, we make a list of potential journals and we say, which is the best journal? ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. Maybe for this one, it's going to be JPCC. So you don't publish in the same journal over and over again. And so again, you're picking a journal, you want it to find the right audience, you want the topic to be specific, so it goes 
comes out for review and actually gets reviewed favorably. You care about things like impact factor and where uh, other papers are going to go. All right, the other reason you want to pick a journal is because you want to know about what their requirements are for that journal. And so if you go to any, pretty much any journal article page, they'll give you something about four authors or authors or something like that. And it'll give you a list of things about preparing for an online submission. And so it basically tells you, here are the rules you need for submitting a paper to our journal. And so in particular, I'd start with author guidelines. And so that's somewhere that's going to tell you the scope of the journal and everything that they're interested in. But it's also going to tell you a lot about the rules. I mean, every single detail in terms of the content you need to submit, but also the aspects of that content. And so things like um, total word slash page count, sometimes that's limited and you have to decide between a communication, which is short two to three pages versus a full article versus a, a letter versus highlight versus a review. They have different rules for each one of those. And so you don't want to start writing an article and find out that you're over the word count by twofold, right? That's, that's really hard to cut down. Uh, other things like abstract word count, um, figure, figures and tables. Some journals actually dictate how many total figures and tables you can have. And so again, that's worth knowing before the planning process. Um, there's also sometimes explicit sections. Like if you have a communication, there's rarely sections. If you have a full article, um, sometimes they require an intro, an experimental, a results, a discussion. And that's actually outlined in this um, uh, journal guidelines or author guidelines. It'll tell you what sections they expect you to have. And then other things like keywords, summary sentences, general audience highlights. Um, they'll also tell you things about, uh, I'll move my head out of the way, but TOC image, what the required size is, what the width and height are of images, what the dots per inch are. And so these author guidelines are very useful in terms of outlining, you know, here's the content you need to create, here's how much of it you can include when you're doing the writing process. And so after we've established that, we know how many pages we have, we know how many figures we have, that's when my group typically goes to the whiteboard to outline things. And so outlining is arguably the most important part. This is the blueprint, this is the template, this is the roadmap towards a publication. And so we'll typically go to the whiteboard and we'll outline not everything, but first we'll outline the introduction and then the results and discussion. discussion. And I'll talk about the intro in a little bit, but uh, results and discussion, this is basically your opportunity to walk through the research, right? And so you're outlining stepwise what you did, why you did it, what you saw. And so our general strategy is we start from the ground up. You start with how something was made, then its properties, then more properties, and then maybe its application. And it ends up looking like a mess like this. And this is the, the shot from a paper we outlined in my office on the whiteboard. And so in addition to you know outlining the topics, so we have things like synthesis, solution photophysics, absorption emissions, so on and so forth. Um, we're not doing full sentences yet. We're just general concepts, right? Synthesis is this. This will turn into a paragraph at some point, but right now we just know we're going to talk about synthesis here and we're going to have a figure, maybe an SI, maybe in the body that looks something like this. And so again, it's just to get the key points organized in a, a particular way and you can decide if the story flows before actually writing sentence level anything. Uh, one thing to note that I really like to do here is put figures and tables on this actual outline. And the reason you do that, because you want to pick, if you can only have five figures, you want to know which five of those figures are ahead of time. So you can get, you know, the beautiful data, the, the publication quality figures, and then the rest of the figures go in SI. And so you can do all that before you even start writing anything in a template or start writing words or sentences of any kind. And so this planning stage is really, really useful, not only for outlining the paper, but one of the things it does for us regularly is it shows where we have gaps in our research. It basically says, here's the story we want to tell. Well, we can't tell this part unless we have this piece of data. And so this is one of the primary reasons I say, don't wait till you've uh, you finished collecting all the data, because the reality is you probably haven't finished that, right? There's some gaps to fill, and it's the quicker you know that, the quicker you can gain that information and do those experiments and fill in those gaps. And so again, outlining is really important in that process. And so if you draw a figure on the board and you don't have that figure yet, you know exactly what experiments you have to do to make that figure and go forward. All right, in terms of ge generating, um, so this is primarily talking about results and discussion, but you'll notice up here, we have a little bit of an introduction uh, section. Again, it's very sparse, uh, UC, S plus A, just very key points. 
When writing an introduction, um, and this is either for a proposal or for a paper, I generally like the funnel strategy, and I don't honestly don't remember who I learned this from, uh, but the idea was to start big and then narrow down. And so this is gonna depend on your audience, but the basic idea behind the funnel strategy is start with some big problem that exists, talk about general strategies to solve the problem, talk about specific strategies, problems with those strategies, our alternative strategy, one specific problem we're gonna do, and then one way to address this question or problem. And so you'll notice here, again, we started very big and then we just ratchet up the specificity as we go down the funnel. And ultimately at the bottom of this, this is exactly what we're gonna do. And so we're taking people on a journey from a really big concept that we're likely not going to solve with a single paper, but we're going to go to specificity, more and more specificity to a problem we are going to solve, and you're going to understand how we solved it by reading this paper. And so this is a journey that, again, is going to depend on the, the expertise of the person reading it, but it, it depends on the audience, but you're going to target you know, as general as can, you can and then specify down. And so here's an example of what I would do for a solar cell paper. And I'm not gonna go through the de details of this, but you can see here, climate change is a problem, alternative energy, solar cells more specific, different kinds of solar cells more specific, Shockley-Questor limit, up conversion solar cells, so on and so forth. And so if I was writing for science or nature, I'd probably start here. If I'm writing for say, JAX, I'd probably start, you know, down here. Um, if I'm writing for a journal of physical chemistry, I can start down here. And so it depends on the audience and how broad they're going to be, where you'd start on this cone and how general you want to be. But again, ultimately, you're starting to narrow down from climate change is a problem that I'm not going to solve with a single journal article to um, record efficiencies, but there's still problems in this paper. We do this specific thing. And so it allows you to take them on that journey with you. All right. So... After you have an outline, a whiteboard outline, that's great, you've, you've, you've outlined the story, but you gotta start putting it in a, in a document of some kind. So this could be Word, this could be LaTeX. Uh, one thing that's really nice about most journals, they actually give you the template. And so if you go in those author guidelines or author or info for authors, again, you'll typically find something that says document templates. And so what they'll give you is literally a document template where you copy and paste your title here, follow their formatting, author names, addresses, abstract. They'll tell you things like word count. Uh, they'll tell you how tables and, um, and images should be formatted. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, single column. Sometimes it's double column. It really depends on the journal. And so this is, again, I, I typically like to pick the journal before I start writing because I don't want to write into this and then have to format it for this. That's just a waste of time. And so some people do it different ways. It's totally up to you. Um, these document templates, typically Word documents or LaTeX if you happen to write in that. Um, but yeah, they have very specific rules uh, regarding how you format those submissions. And again, if you don't follow their formatting, the editor can say your article's not appropriate, go reformat it and resubmit it. So it is, it is an important thing. Uh, with that said, there are some journals that say, we don't care what the format is, just go ahead and submit it. All right, so we have a template, we have an outline on the whiteboard. The next step is just to translate between the two, right? So take these bullet points, start to put them in text form, um, and here's where we start to insert figures. And so um, my general advice to students is just basically copy and paste this exact same thing, not literally, but um, write, the, write the bullet point sentences, put the figures in there, and start to generate figures that you're gonna actually include in the paper. And so the place that you typically include figures, and the journals will do this formatting when they get to the proof stage but you also want your reviewers not to hate you and so typically you'll put your figure right after the first mention and so here it's in this paper we expand this effort structural diversity blah 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 figure one that's exactly where figure one shows up and then molecular synthesis that's where scheme one shows up and so you want it to be readily available right after you see it and so you could start inserting your figures into this template one of the things I recommend my students do right away, it's very easy to get lazy with figures and just have them messy and not great. I recommend doing, if you know a figure is going to end up in your paper, just make it publication quality right away. I mean, there's no point in spending time to make a bad figure when you could just spend time to make a good figure that will ultimately end up in the paper. 
And so I guess if you guys take home one thing from this entire talk that I give today, it's, it's I, I care a lot about figures, graphs, and tables. And if, if you can glean some information from what I'm presenting and take it with you, not just for your papers, but also your presentations, your second year talks, your qualifying exams, I will feel like this has been a success. And so uh, if you're going to pay attention to any aspects of my talk, this is probably the most useful one. And I'm not the first person to have strong opinions about figures, graphs, and tables. And there's, there's a bunch of papers. Uh, here's one example, a brief guide designing effective figures for scientific papers. Um, here's the link here. Again, I'll forward this PowerPoint away and he'll send it out to you guys. Um, but some of the quotes from this paper, figures are often the first part of a scientific paper that's reviewed by the editor. Again, the editor is not going to read your entire paper before deciding whether it should be reviewed or not. They don't have time to do that. And so they can just skim the abstract and look at the figures and say, is this relevant to my journal? Is this interesting? Uh, your goal is to convey the largest amount of information in the shortest amount of time. They should not be seen as decoration. They convey facts, ideas, and relationships far more concisely than descriptive text. And so it's, it's not just that the figure is a bonus, it's that the figure is replacing something that's hard to explain word for word. Also, well-designed figures can help an audience better understand the objective and results of your research. And that is our goal as scientists, right? We're trying to explain phenomena as quickly and cleanly, as concisely as possible. And we're going to do that by any means necessary, including text and including figures. And again, these are quotes from this particular paper. And so they offer a bunch of advice, just stylistic choices. Those of you that have graphic design experience, you have a head start on this because the rules for making an advertisement or you know making a website are the same for making a figure. And it, it, it's there are certain innate human traits that make us say we like things when they line up. We like when colors agree. And so, so that's what you want your reader to feel. They, you don't want them discomforted by having to look at something like this. It's much more comforting to look at something that lines up, right? Right? and the images aren't all displaced, they're all randomly placed. So structure matters, contrasting matters in terms of color, shape, position, weight, all of these factors, you can dictate where someone's eye looks. And so you can emphasize via color, you want them to pay attention to this point right here. And so if you're conveying something for a graph or a synthesis or an image, you can control what someone is looking at and how they feel about the data based on how you present that information. And so just making choices about how you emphasize different aspects of the image. Uh, typography, this is really underappreciated, especially generating figures where you have text overlaying on a background. I mean, things like white text on black, that's obvious, but what happens when you have an AFM image that translates between white and gray, white and gray? Sometimes it's going to be hard to see those. And so you really have to play games with like shadowing and text color and fonts. Um, but you want, again, the information to be as clean and as clearly conveyed as possible. And so text on images is one of those that can, it, it can really harm you. If they can't read the text, you're in trouble. They can't understand your image. Um, <laughs> this is a really fun example. This is one they used from their particular paper where someone came up with a first draft of an image that looks something like this. And when I see something like that, I'm reminded of a quote from Jurassic Park. This was from the Ian Malcolm character. Um, they were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop, stop to think if they should. And so this is one of those examples where it's basically, I have all these drawing and artistic tools in front of me. I am going to use every single one of them in this graph. I'm going to use glowing. I'm going to use 3D images and transparencies and 3D boxes and shapes and all sorts of different colors. And that's not your goal, right? It's not creating art for the sake of art. Um, and instead, you want to convey a message. And so it's really fun in this paper, they go through the iteration from this figure to a simplified figure to ultimately the publication quality figure. And you can see each one of these, they're basically starting over from scratch. But compare this to this in terms of what message you're trying to say, what details you want to convey, what ideas you want to emphasize. This tells you exactly the reaction that's happening. It's telling you conditions it's happening at. Here you can barely read this text. It's de-emphasizing this. For some reason, the tip is the most important part of this particular image. And so again, it's really... You have to think like an outsider looking in. What information would you want to see and how can they convey it as quickly as possible? And so just some general advice. I know it seems like fun to add a bunch of, you know, stylistic and color things, um, but it's not necessary most of the time. And so it's, it's good to remove unnecessary shapes and glow, increase the size of important components. 
Um, use uniform fonts and colors. Alignment matters, how things align vertically as well as horizontally. Um, uh, golden ratio is something interesting, like human perception, for some reason, we really like this golden ratio. We want the ratio of width to height to be 1.6. And so that could be higher width or longer width versus height or height versus width. But something about that is very intuitive to us for some reason. All right, moving on. Uh, this is just an example from some of our work. When we start to make figures, usually we'll outline them on the board first, then the student will take a first pass at it or a first couple passes at the draft. And then ultimately, this is what a publication quality image looks like. And so you can see, again, we had kind of a vision. This doesn't really look like this, but we don't know what this is going to look like till we actually make it. And so we start editing and formatting and deciding what's important and ultimately you end up with something that looks like this. And so although you're dedicated to your initial image, you have to realize that it's going to get edited, it's going to get changed, and eventually, hopefully, it comes out as the best possible version. And so this is through feedback, this is through repetition, you're going to get to a publication quality image. Uh, one thing to note, especially those of you that draw uh, molecules, if you draw molecules in ChemDraw, you can highlight the molecule and go up to, I don't know, I think it's formatting, and you can actually select ACS style ChemDraw images, which has a very specific bond length and width and height, and, and it has uh, font sizes. They have optimized what a publication quality molecules, molecular structure should look like. And these are, I'm, I'm almost 100% positive, these are ACS style. I think it's 1996 ACS styles when they decided that particular formatting. And so again, iterate from whiteboard to draft after draft after draft to eventually a publication quality image. Um, tables, uh, tables are a little simpler. Uh, generally, what I do is go to the journal and look at what their kind of table formatting is. Very rarely will I submit a journal or an article that has the exact same formatting as the journal because this is very specific to them. But you want your tables to be clear, right? You want the partitions to be obvious. You want to be able to delineate rows and columns and what information they're conveying. Because ultimately, what the editor is going to do after your article is accepted is convert this into this down here. And you can see it's pretty close one-to-one -one conversion. The only difference is the formatting difference between them. And so, um, again, slight differences, but for the most part, this is what it ends up being. And so if you're going to make uh, tables, I recommend looking at the target journal and see what widths they do typically, how many, how big it is, and try to mimic that as much as possible. And if not mimicking, mimicking it exactly, uh, just make it as clear as possible for the reader, uh, the reviewer. All right, publication quality graphs. This is, as a spectroscopist, this is probably one of the things I take most seriously, so I apologize for any of you that don't make graphs in your papers. Uh, maybe synthetic organic chemists will not have that many graphs, but in general, if you make a graph, some of these rules are universally applied. And so there's a really nice article out of uh, Prashant Kamat and George Schatz. George Schatz was an editor for Journal of Physical Chemistry. Uh, Prashant Kamat, he was the editor-in-chief for Journal of Physical Chemistry Letters and ultimately started ACS Energy Letters. These guys know what they're talking about. And so you can see here 34,000 views of this article. Only eight citations, but 34,000 views. Clearly, people care about uh, figures and how to make the best quality figures possible. And so here's a link down here if you guys want to read the full paper. I'm just going to highlight uh, one of the particular examples they did. And so they basically said, if you want to make a quality image, here's some of the things you can do that. And so here's just an example. Um, so they're highlighting legends to identify the traces. You have A, B, C, D, and E. Whatever those identify will be described in the caption. Uh, they care about having bold axis lines, uh, visible major and minor ticks, so you can see what the number values are. Um, uh, data in the inset, um, show it actually has some fitting or some correlation. Uh, distinguishing vibrant colors, in this case black, red, green, orange, blue. And then again, access titles with bold or larger font than the actual units associated with them. Uh, one thing I'm going to disagree with them about, and I'll get into this a little bit here, um, they have their minor ticks. So, so major ticks are where the actual numbers are. So this is a major tick, and this is a major tick. And then here are minor ticks. I disagree with their strategy of having ticks in on the X and the Y axis. I agree with it on the, uh, the matching X, the top X, and the, the right side Y. But I don't agree with it on this one because you can't tell if that's a tick or that's an actual data point. So if your lines actually are black and they line up with the ticks here, you cannot tell if that's a, you know, an anomalous 
uh, downward movement in data or if it's actually a tick. And so I'd move those lines out. But other than that, I, I agree with this uh, particular strategy. Um, so just some more examples of this. Again, it you can't have too many spectra on, on, a, on, on a graph, otherwise it gets messy. The maximum I would ever do is something about five. And so you can see here, even at five, if they're overlaying, it starts to become a mess. But if they're color delineated, you can tell a difference. And so things like purples, reds, blues, orange, green, pretty easy to tell the difference. If you go to something like this, like light yellow and cyan and magenta and pink, uh, for those of you that's seeing on the projector, this is probably very vibrant, but also painful to look at. Um, this, on the other hand, is, is gentle. You can see this, you can differentiate images. So I, I typically avoid these colors in general and stick with this general color palette here. All right, other things about this graph. Um, I'd always keep the numbers the same size as well as the labels on each axis the same size. Uh, no titles. I know sometimes if you're using Excel, it defaults to putting a title in there. That's We don't typically publish titles. That's what the caption is for. Um, uh, this is one of my pet peeves when reading a paper actually is that you want reasonable spacing. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, this is 400 to 450. You can tell this is a 50 interval. The halfway point is 25, right? And so that gives you a really easy round number that you can do math on. In contrast, if you use numbers like four or 17 or 30, so, so some graphing programs will spit out a default just based on your starting and ending point. Don't rely on that to put the right units here because it gets really annoying. If this is a space of 17, what's the halfway point? It's 8.5. It takes time to think about that. You don't want to make your reader or reviewer work because that makes them frustrated and hate your paper. And so when I say reasonable intervals, typically 1, 2, 5, 10, 50, 100, and same thing with 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, things that are easy to divide and mentally not taxing to figure out halfway points or three quarter points, so on and so forth. So avoid random numbers, prime numbers that aren't divisible because that just frustrates the reader. All right, a few other things. I mentioned this, why, why I disagree with uh, George Schatz and uh, Prashant Kamat is I would recommend doing ticks out here. And again, it's because if the ticks go in and they overlap with your data, it's hard to differentiate data from ticks. Um, other things, the sides and top, I don't feel as strongly because typically there isn't overlapping data on the side and top, so you don't have to worry about that. You should leave enough spacing that you can see it anyway. Um, what I just mentioned to you guys about major ticks not doing weird spacing, one of the reasons you want to do that is because you also have something called minor ticks. And so major ticks are at the number points, minor ticks are the interval between those. Right, and so in this particular graph, we have 400, 410, 420, 430, 440, 450. And so we made it really obvious. Here we have four minor ticks. They're partitioned by tens. It's really easy to figure out. This is 430, this is 410, so on and so forth. And so what you don't want to do is say three minor ticks, right? So if you do three, you have to take 50 divided by four. It just, it, it becomes a mental mess. And so basically this is just a rough outline. You guys can go through the math in your heads, but if you have a major tick spacing of one and you have one minor tick, that minor ticks at 0.5. If there's four, then it's at 0.2. And so you go from zero to 0.2 to 0.4 to 0.6, so on and so forth till you get to one. And so if your spacing is two, you could have one or three minor ticks. If it's five, one or four minor ticks. Again, this is this seems like an obsessive detail, but this is no joke when you're reading a paper. There's nothing more frustrating than seeing these numbers not make sense. All right, a few other things. Uh, make sure to have space above and below the data. Um, sometimes you cut it off on the side, sometimes top and bottom, but the basic idea is you don't want to uh, mislead. You don't want to show this show that something isn't returning to baseline. You don't want it to seem like it's deceptive. And so what do I mean by that? So if I take a graph like this, and let's say I know the spectra returns to zero, but I graph this from zero to whatever, I'm basically cutting off this portion of data and I'm cutting off this portion of data. And so if I'm really skeptical, I can say, what's happening to this data? Did it actually return to baseline or did it actually go below baseline? And most of the time, this isn't going to matter, but there are some occasions where if it goes below, something's really wrong or something weird is happening. If it goes to baseline, that's what it should be doing. But the point is, if you just look at this, we can't tell what's happening to your data beyond this point. And so it's, it's good to have spacing on the top and bottom so you can show all your data and not be accused of misleading or be accused of hiding anything. 
All right, um, a few other minor things. Uh, again, it's not necessarily minor, it could be major, but one of my other pet peeves is when I see people graphing multiple things together. So each, each of these graphs independently is, is a quality graph. But when you put these graphs together, there's something that's a bit misleading about them. And so it's very subtle here, but this one goes 300 to 450. This one goes from 300 to 430. And so what that does is give the artificial impression that these peaks are further to the, well, we'll say low energy side here, and these peaks are further to the high energy side. Not only that, but the, the axis here is also different. This goes to 1.4, this goes to 1.2. It's misleading that you'd say four is as intense as number one, and that's not the case. And so when you're matching up um, graphs, I would do it not just as individual graphs make them quality, but also the pairings quality. And so here you can see these are both on the same axis here, both on the same axis here, which means you can do an apples to apples visual comparison between these two. You can say this peak is here, that peak is there, this one is red shifted, this one's blue shifted. You can see the peak intensities are lower for these two versus these two. Again, your goal is to make life as easy as possible for the reviewer and the reader of your article so they can go through your information and you're just trying to convey it as cleanly and concisely as possible. All right, a few other things beyond that. Um, you can do line plus symbol. Uh, if you're gonna do symbols in the graph, the reason to do this was if you have multiple data sets that are overlaying each other and it's hard to see them independently. And so here one and two are almost identical. It's very hard to see, especially if you print in black and white. And so one way to do it is adding shapes, but you wanna make sure the shapes don't overlay as well. And so the way to do this is typically offset them. Here's just some general guidelines. Make the shapes large enough that you can actually see the shapes. Uh, you can see this is a square. You can see this is a circle. Make them different shapes. Make them alternating uh, filled and empty, but also change the spacing between them so they're not overlaying like they are here. And so you can have boxes that are clearly visible, circles that are visible, and then they start to really overlap here. Um, worst case scenario, if you have a black and white image with five spectra and five different shapes, it's a lot of work, but you can differentiate these different curves. Again, they're, they're all printed the exact same color, but as long as the shapes are different and the shapes are clearly trending, you can tell that the triangle graph is right here. You can see that the diamond graph is right here. So again, I wouldn't recommend this, but this does show you the power of adding shapes. Even if you don't have colors, you can still see the differences between them. All right, a few other notes, uh, just broader picture things in terms of advice and making figures. Um, one thing I like to do through an entire journal article is keep my color scheme consistent. And so let's say you have sample one, sample two, sample three. Sample one is always red, sample two is always blue, sample three is always purple. And so throughout the entire article, the, if, if a reader can remember this, they don't have to go through and read the legend every single time. Instead, they'll say, okay, this PT, TC, PP is gonna be red, it's red here, it's red here, this bilayer is purple here, the bilayer is purple here. I know exactly what I'm tracking. I know the relationships between these different samples. Mm -hmm. Other things, make use of solid and dashed lines. Here's an example where you have the experimental data as a solid and then the fitting to the data as a dashed line. It's really easy in a caption to say experimental data is a solid line. Uh, the fitting is a dashed line. And so it makes it really clear what those are depicting. Uh, likewise, if you have multiple overlapping spectra, but different phenomena, like here's an example where the solid line is absorbance, which coincides with this graph, and a dashed line is intensity or emission, photoluminescent intensity, which is the right axis here. And so again, in the caption, you can say absorption, solid line, emission, dashed line, people know exactly what you're talking about. Other things, if you're like watching a change over time, you can use things like color gradients. So rather than having to label every single one of these, you can say, this is a transition from black to green with the spectra every five minutes. And you can see it goes from here to here to here, so on and so forth. There's the inset describing that data. Same thing here, it goes from here to here to here to here, the change. And so you can make it very simple and appealing to the eye by using color gradients and some graphic design strategies. Other things, creating multiple layers in a graph. You can use multiple axes. Um, so this is an example where you have absorbance on one side and uh, emission intensity on the other, rather than relying on solid and dash as we, as we did over here. You can rely on different axes and arrows pointing towards them. You can also color, co color coordinate this with this right here. So you know exactly which spectra corresponds to which axis. All right. Uh, another thing about insets, I see this way too often reviewing papers where people do insets, 
but the 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 captions are way too small. Not the captions, but the labels are way too small to read. Basically, t- they take a big figure and they shrink it down, and these end up being tiny. You don't want to do that again. Don't make your reader work. Give them and give them sizes that they can actually read and labels that they can actually see. And so you can see here in both of these cases, it's pretty obviously visible. And so this is another example of color coding where this uh, this B rupee is the same color as the B rupee here. Rupee is the same color as rupee. It tells a story. The big change here is rupee from here to rupee here. Spectra goes away where it was here. And so this combines shapes plus colors plus insets plus um, uh, labeling of those of those different samples. So yeah, a lot to digest, but the goal again is to get the best quality figures you can. This is a repetitive process. And so when you make a figure and you're or a graph and figure and you're happy about it, um, double check if it's really what you want to convey. And so when you're in doubt, copy of previous examples, um, print it in black and white to make sure if somebody else prints it, it's still going to be obvious and conveyed very clearly, but also ask a colleague for feedback and don't get angry when they tell you it looks terrible because that happens. Any advice you can get from them, they are the reader. They are the reviewer. The feedback they give you is probably the feedback you'd get from somebody else. And so take those comments and their advices, uh, seriously, because it can be very useful. All right, so I have a few bad examples here. Um, if we were doing this in person, I would ask you guys what's wrong with this figure. I'm not going to do that because the, the microphone quality is not great in terms of exchanging with the open room, but uh, you guys can throw comments in chats if you want. I'll give you 30 seconds. What is wrong with this graph? I think you all, you're all getting the idea, right? We can, we can look at a paper and find this. I'm just going to show you briefly how I would correct this. Uh, one, the units here, spacing of 15 is really dumb. This halfway point of 15 is 7.5. What's the halfway point there? Tell me off the top of your head what this number is. It's not easy math to do. Uh, here instead, we can go, you know, 140 to 150. This is roughly at 130, right? We know, or, or 145, sorry. It's the halfway point between the two. Other things, this one is a subtle one too. They use Raman intensity. Um, this may be a specific example, but this is one of my other pet peeves is you don't need to put commentary in your graphs. And what I mean by commentary is all graphs are showing is the data that you've collected and the information you're trying to convey from that data. A detector doesn't see Raman intensity. In fact, they are making a bold conclusion here saying the only thing that's contributing to this signal here is Raman scattering. And that is 100% not going to be the case. And so there is no value added, including this label. You can simply say intensity, and that's what it looks like. A few other things, again, putting units on this axis, even adding something subtle as counts. Um, also, there's a whole lot of redundant data in this legend. And so they've taken up a, a third of their graph with just visual noise that is unnecessary. All of this could be included in the uh, caption. The only difference between these is that one zero molar, one molar, two molar, three molar, four molar, four, four molar, plus something else. And so you could really, really simplify this graph quite a bit. Uh, other stuff, dashes in, you can put those dashes out. Same thing over here. Again, if they're overlapping, you can't tell if that's data or that's a, um, a tick mark. All right, here's another example. Go ahead and throw your comments in chat. What is wrong with this graph? Weird. Yeah, so I can give you guys how I would adjust this. Again, you mentioned this, the, 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 the units here, this is a 30 spacing, this is a 25 spacing. There's mo no minor ticks here showing you anything. Uh, it's kind of, this is blurred out. This is, it's basically trying to convey that the RMS is the most important thing, whether they want to or not. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention earlier, but you have to be aware of is when you're connecting dots, you have to be careful about, about what is implied when you connect those dots. And so in this particular case, you have a dot here, which is a data point. You have a dot here, which is a data point. By connecting these, you're implying that if you do a three times measurement, that value will be here. And you just don't have enough information to convey that. For all we know, this curve looks something like this. For all we know, it could be a sine wave. And so this is implicit data that's not necessarily meaningful. Um, this is one of those things you have to ask yourself is, is a graph the best thing to represent this data? When you look at this, this is essentially six numbers. So you can convey those six numbers in a table. Um, you could convey those six numbers even in the text, um, or maybe make it as a bar graph, right? If you do a histogram and say this number here, this number here, because right now this is not particularly useful. All right, last one.
All right, so one thing, again, I, I do spectroscopy, so this is one specific to spectroscopy, but to be fair, half of you will join groups that do spectroscopy-related things. So if you're gonna do an absorbance, never put AU. AU implies absorbance units, that's not, or, or arbitrary units. That's not what this is. Um, you either leave it as absorbance or optical density, because this is an actual scale describing a percent absorbance. So yeah, get rid of AU. Other things, there's no minor ticks. The major ticks are facing inward. This is a spacing of 200. Somebody tell me what that peak is really quick. It's very hard to do, right? And so it's it's not conveying information quickly or cleanly. Another weird thing about this, and I think one of you mentioned this, this is the zero baseline. This data is going below zero. This is the zero baseline. Presumably it's the same data, but it's aligning up differently. So I don't know. They did a correction here that they didn't do here. Um, but yeah, this this is very misleading in terms of Negative absorbance is not a thing. This is a, uh, a this is a correction problem that they're doing, and so not only that, but they're also cutting off the data here at 800. So does it d drop down here? Or does it keep going straight? It falls below zero magically. We need to know what's happening with that data. And so again, having spaces, having where you can see it, having where you can see it, it hits baseline. A lot of valuable things can happen. All right, um, the last note on graphs is captions. Um, uh, basically, s my main goal with any caption I write for a figure is just say what that figure is about. And so here's two example here. You guys can read this through when you have the PowerPoint, but basically my goal is state exactly what's being presented, right? Say what the sample is, say what uh, property you're measuring. This is a UV vis absorption spectra. B is a normalized emission. Uh, C is time resolved emission decay. That is exactly what's happening. You tell the conditions like solvent and atmosphere and what wavelengths or intensity or whatever it might be, things like lambda excitation 420, uh, that information goes here, um, spectra of that particular sample, uh, so on and so forth. One thing I do when I write these captions is I try to avoid redundancy as much as possible. And so um, an example of that is sometimes people would write, this is the absorption spectra of X, this is the absorption spectra of Y. You can consolidate, consolidate that to say absorption spec spectra of X, parentheses A, and Y, B. So you can cut out you know 30% of the text by getting rid of that redundancy. Uh, make sure everything that shows up here has a description, uh, whether it's the actual spectra or the inset, there should be a mention. And so here it's uh, A has the absorption spectra, inset, Langmuir isotherm that represents this data. And so everything should be described. Um, one other thing I recommend is not include commentary in the captions. And what I mean by that is don't add additional conclusions that aren't uh, aren't necessary. Don't say here we can see the formation of blah, blah, blah. And it's, that's making a conclusion, that's not presenting the data. And so I, I, it's not an explicit rule that you can't do that, but I would save those explanations for the text and leave this to just showing the data as it's presented. All right, grinding forward, we have a template outline, we've made publication quality figures, publication quality graphs, publication quality tables, and we've compiled them into a document. We have all our bullet points, we've filled in our last uh, um, uh, missing parts, and eventually you're just gonna start writing the paper. And so the general idea is take these sentences and translate them, or take these bullet points and translate them into sentences, tie those sentences together in a cohesive way. Um, I am by no means a, a, an expert at English or writing, so I won't convey how you should do that. But I will give you some advice in terms of your results and discussion section. The basic flow point I would, or flow I would always use when describing data or describing a measurement and results is follow this general strategy. Go from the method to the data, describe the results, explain the results, and then tie it together. And I'll explain to you what that means. Basically, you wanna walk your reader through what's going on in the graph. Like you've seen it a thousand times, you know the ending before you even start the discussion, but you want them to see what you see. You want to lead them to the conclusions that you've been led to. And so the way to do that is say, we measured X using Y. So here's the measurement we did. did. The results can be seen here in this figure or table. Then you can describe the results as you see them on there. You can say, this is higher than this, this is lower than this, this is red, this is blue. And then you can say, here's what we think is going on with the data. So we've described the experiment, we've shown where the data is, we describe a trend in the data, and then we explain what's happening. And then you can tie this together with other data in the paper. And so you're not starting with a conclusion, instead you're starting with the data and going from there and taking people on a journey with you. Mm -hmm. 
And so here's an example from one of our papers, but it's the same basic idea. Back electron transfer was monitored at a 400 and the traces can be seen here. So that's what we did. Here's where the data is. And here just describes there's initially a sharp decrease in signal, literally just walking through what's happening in the data. And then eventually talk about, as previously observed, comparing the literature, KBT is slower. That's what the data is actually saying. So the conclusion doesn't happen down here until you've actually introduced the data, walked through the trends in the data, and then say, here's what we think is happening in it. And then ultimately the implications of that are how it ties to something else. Uh, again, when you're writing sentences, whether it be the introduction or, or the, the paper part, you want short, clear sentences. Keep in mind your readership. Are they a physical chemist or are they a broader audience? You're going to have to explain things differently depending on who your audience is. This is true for papers. This is true for proposals. You are not writing. Writing is not what you want to say. It's what they need to hear. And so you really have to target your audience when you do it. All right, just a few general things about writing papers. Uh, I'd strongly recommend avoid being hyperbolic. And by hyperbolic, I mean phrases like extreme, very high, large. Um, these, these words are not meaningful on an absolute scale. And what I mean by that is go back to 2001 and take a look at a high definition TV. Right, those those terms about extreme and very, they are dated, right? Because it's always things will always get faster, things will always get smaller, things will always get very much more, whatever. And so you can avoid any issues with that by just not using terminology like this. Um, other things you can do: don't be pretentious. And this is something I catch often when I'm reading art articles. Someone will describe data and say, "Well, obviously this is, or clearly, or it's easy to see, or trivially can viewed, blah blah blah." This is passing judgment on your readership, and so that's that sounds, I don't know, that sounds overly grandiose. But what I'm basically saying is. Just because it's obvious to you does not mean it's not obvious to the reader. And if it's not obvious to them, you have insulted them by including, including these useless words. And so there's absolutely no reason to include these in your text. It, it doesn't add anything to your explanation. You only risk insulting your readership. And so get rid of them entirely. Other things to note, formatting things about italics and subscripts and superscripts. Again, you don't want to key up on some reviewer's pet peeve by not having superscripts where they're necessary. Uh, spaces between numbers and units. Uh, this is typically like you're reading this as the words 400 and this the word nanometers. You put a space between those. Um, that's generally true, but not always true. Um, when multiplying things, use an actual multiplication symbol instead of an X. This is, again, a very subtle thing. The editors will take care of this, but again, don't piss off your reviewers. Other things to note, things like effect versus effect, and versus and, um, presence versus presence, like word choice matters. These are subtle English things, but uh, worth noting. Um, so yeah, pay attention to those. And so if you want to learn more about this, uh, the ACS actually puts out an ACS style guide. Um, this is an image for the third edition. They're probably beyond that now, but uh, on campus you have access to this. It basically walks you through these things. The units that you should use, the standard nomenclature, the recommended formatting. It gives you all these details to write the best paper you possibly can. All right, so you've, you've thrown introduction in there, you have your results and discussion, you have all your figures, your graphs. This is by far the hardest part. And that, that's, you're starting from basically scratch and you're trying to generate a, a paper and it feels absolutely overwhelming. So the advice I have for you is just get it out there. Get a first draft out there, revise, revise, revise. Do the best you can, but step one is just starting to write. And there's a huge activation barrier to that. But the reason you're gonna do that is because you spent all that work writing something like this and you love your text and it's absolutely beautiful and then you give it to your PI and they give you back this. And so this is word tracking changes and you can see everything has been absolutely destroyed. And so I had this issue when I wrote my first paper, I was in love with my first draft because I was like, this is magnificently written. And then my uh, graduate advisor, as well as his, um, his senior scientist, absolutely tore it to shreds. And looking back on it, my writing was terrible. My vision of what was good versus what is actually good did not coincide at all. And so ultimately their changes were good, but you need to get this first draft out there, but don't be too emotionally attached to it because it's probably gonna get torn to shreds. It might be changed completely by the time you're done with it, but this is the learning process. This is what you have to do to get good at writing papers. It took me, I don't know, 30 to 40 papers before I started getting good at writing them by myself. And so it takes time and it takes practice.
All right, I'll just briefly go through the other aspects of this. Um, in terms of conclusions, here's just a rough outline. You basically want to summarize key outcomes, uh, remark on the implications, and identify future issues and challenges. Um, here's just an example from one of ours. You can see I've highlighted those different key components. Uh, summarizing the outcomes here, implications as well as future work. Here's what we have to do to realize the full potential of blah, blah, blah. And so when you guys read papers, you'll start to recognize that certain flows are consistent over and over again. And this is one example of that. Again, summarize outcomes, implications, as well as future work. Um, abstract, there's a slightly different flow associated with it, but your goal with the abstract is different than the actual paper. Your abstract is just a preview of the content for the paper. And so you're doing a basically a brief summary of the work, but it's readable to the average audience member so they can decide whether they want to dive into that paper or not. And so just a general flow of this, do one or two sentences introduction as to why you're doing the work you're doing, a few sentences on the methodology and abs observations, and then something summarizes the impact or implications of that work. And here's an example of that. Sometimes you have a very short word count, like um, typically letters, like organic letters or Journal of Physical Chemistry letters will have very short abstracts. You don't necessarily get to include everything. And so you pick on the key things that you want to include. If, you're, if you have a 300 uh, character count, you're, you have to cut it down. You can't say everything you want to say. All right, beyond that, so you've written the entire paper, you have an abstract, you have a conclusion, then I would start talking about a title. And so a title is to convey what the paper is about. And so here it says, capture the essence of the paper. You want it to be simple, straightforward, um, explaining what the actual content is. You want it to appeal to a broader readership and use as little of words as possible. Um, one thing I recommend, and some journals explicitly say this, do not use phrases like significant, highly efficient, novel, new, facile, fast, because again, these are relative terms and they will become dated very quickly. Also things like new and novel, if you're publishing it, it's nearly 100% sure something in your paper is new. And so that is effectively redundant information that should not be included in your title. Uh, one thing to note about as few as words as possible to convey the topic, there's actually research on this that says the shorter your title, the more likely it is to be cited. And so this is just a graph basically saying the, the length of your title versus the, uh, the citation ranking. Shorter titles get cited more. And so I'm sure there's some deep-seated psychological reason behind that. Um, for you guys, let's just say, try to make your title as short as possible to not waste reviewer's time or reader's time um, and convey the information as quickly as you can. So yeah, take home short titles, higher citations. All right, so title, again, it's just a drafting process. Come up with a bunch of examples, have your colleagues vote, revise, refine, have them vote again, and eventually come up with a title that everyone actually likes and wants to read. And so again, this, this just like figures, just like text, the key is getting it out there early, going through a revision process, going through a revision process, getting feedback from your colleagues to ultimately make the best title you possibly can. Um, TOC image, same idea as an abstract, but it's doing it in visual form. Basically, this is going to convey information about your paper, but do so as quickly as possible. In the modern day and age of scrolling through journal articles, um, arguably the TOC image is more um, important than the abstract. I mean, this is your moment to grab the reader's attention. You want something that stands out, makes the results obviously obvious. Um, this is how you catch their attention. And so the thing is, when you're browsing a journal, you get about 15 seconds, if you're lucky, for someone to be look at this and be captured and riveted enough to click on PDF to actually view your article and ultimately, hopefully, cite it. Beyond that, sometimes they're included in the article to convey the information in a graphical form. Um, and these are what shows up on Twitter when you tweet them out or Instagram or whatever it may be. Um, so these graphical abstracts are becoming uh, increasingly important. So it's worth spending time making a good TOC image. All right, so uh, TOC image, I'll just go through this briefly. The journals have requirements, and so they'll typically tell you exactly what size the TOC image should be. Um, then make boxes those size to give you an idea how much room you have. Go to a whiteboard and start writing out different examples. And so here's three different examples of conveying the same thing. Decide which one you think is gonna convey the message mo most accurately. And then from there, what I typically do is design these in PowerPoint, but I'll create a box that has that exact aspect ratio, and then I'll just start filling it up. 
And so the idea is to use as much space as possible without it looking colored uh, or cluttered, but make sure things align, make sure things are aesthetically appealing, and then just go through iterations, go through step after step after step, trying to modify slight things, and hopefully you'll come to something that looks pretty. And so this is an example from one of our particular papers. This is what our PowerPoint ends up looking like, just very uh, iterative um, drawings of the same information again, changing the colors, changing the text, changing what's highlighted. You can see just slightly different versions of this until you come across something you really like. And so the train of thought on TOCs, start with an image, start with it in the right aspect ratio and size for the journal, uh, come across different iterations of it until you find something that you like that can be a TOC image, and then maybe turn it into cover art. Um, it depends on whether you're invited to do that or not. Uh, one thing you don't want to end up on is this uh, Tumblr account, which is TOC Raffle. This is, uh, for those of you not familiar, rolling on the floor laughing because your TOC images are so terrible. Uh, it's kind of a funny web page. Um, these are just some examples of terrible TOC images that are either nonsensical, poorly drawn, don't know what this is conveying, this is kind of nonsensical, this doesn't tell you anything. Don't end up on TOC Raffle because you want your images to do, you want them to engage people and not in a laughing way. So again, TOC images matter, but yeah, take a look at this Tumblr account. There are some really terrible TOC images out there. All right, beyond that, you're gonna do more rounds of revisions. You're gonna, the, the revisions this time will be much more gentle, right? Rather than having complete blocks of text canceled out, it's only gonna be sentence level editing and eventually it'll get to its final form that will end up in a publication. All right. Um, one thing about references, I would recommend that you don't do references manually or type out references. Find some kind of software that can add references because um, it'll auto format for you. And I'll just, one we use in my group is EndNote. And EndNote allows you to download the citation and have a library of them and then insert them in the paper. Um, it's basically download the reference, import it in the software, and then insert it in the manuscript. And so this is really nice. Basically, any journal you look at, it's going to have some kind of thing like tools where you can export a citation. Um, ACS has this right here, export button. You can export citation and abstract. RSC has something similar right here. It basically allows you to get all the information about authors, titles, journals, years, volume, abstracts, everything at once. Makes your life really easy because then you just insert them into the software and then insert them into the text. And you can translate these articles into an actual reference that shows up in the paper. And so ultimately it's gonna look like an actual publication. Uh, one thing to note about references, include a citation for every scientific claim you make. Um, cite a little bit of everybody, especially your suggested reviewers. You don't wanna make your reviewers angry again. Um, avoid too much self-citation. It's very easy to just cite your own work over and over again, and we've done this more than once, but uh, try to avoid it because sometimes people will actually comment on it. Um, use the appropriate journal format. One thing that's really nice about this formatting software is you can pick ACS um, different formats for RSC or Wiley or whoever the publication is because they sometimes require full names versus half names, sometimes the title, not the title, ordering of year and volume. This software software or whatever software you use will do that for you automatically. So it saves you a lot of work, particularly if you have to go and add references later or you have to revise the uh, ordering of references, you do not want to do that manually over and over again. All right, beyond that, supporting information is basically everything else you have, experimental details, additional data you have. Um, typically, there's not a template for supporting information. I would just find one strategy and we typically just copy and paste it over and over again. Um, but again, the same rules regarding you know quality of figures and graphs, you wanna convey uh, information as clearly as possible. One thing to note about experimental details, try to take a third party view and decide what needs to be included for someone to reproduce your results. And so I know many of you in the audience have tried to reproduce something in literature and you can't do it. And the reason is they have omitted key details that you actually need to complete the actual experiment. And so don't be the person that you hate. Um, include every experimental detail you can. If it's a new experimental setup, include a, a picture of it, include additional text. There is no word limit on supporting information, so make the most of it as you can.
All right, beyond that, you have a manuscript and SI ready for submission. Then you wanna go through all the authors plus collaborators. You wanna make sure the author list is correct. Uh, make sure every author sees the manuscript before you submit it. Uh, that's just out of respect for your colleagues. You don't want them signing off on something they haven't seen because they might disagree with what you're submi submitting. So make sure they see the manuscript before you submit it. Um, one thing we like to do in my group is talk through what we think reviewers will comment on whether it's another experiment they want or they might not like the impact of it or they might not think it's appropriate for the journal, talk through those changes and address as many as you can right before submitting. All right, after that, there's a submission process. Some of you will do this with your PIs, other your PIs will handle it, but basically you go to a website and says, I wanna submit a paper and it's gonna walk you through the steps of that, picking the journal type, uploading the title, uploading the abstract, so on and so forth. And so here's the typical checklist of what you need, manuscripts, supporting information, TOC image, cover letter, this is written to the editor saying, I think this is good for your journal and this is why, and then ultimately suggested reviewers, reviewers that you think are appropriate to review View this paper and say whether it's quality science or not. They don't have to take these suggested reviewers. I think typically they take at least one of them. Um, so it's worth doing, but don't assume that it's going to go out to the list of people you've said. And then you wait three to whatever number of weeks and ultimately hopefully get a decision. Um, I'm not going to go through the details on this because time is getting short, but basically your, your outcomes can be published without change, which never happens, <laughs> publish after minor change, after major revision, to preliminary or publish elsewhere. Um, basically these criteria tell you what you're going to have to do. And so anything down here is going to be rejected outright. Something up here is probably going to be, you'll have to write some kind of reply to reviewers and make revisions accordingly. And so you guys can go through these pairings. Again, it's very rarely do you get accepted without change but sometimes you'll get one of those and then somebody else will say minor revisions that means it's going to be accepted but you should make those minor changes after that you'll get proofs uh, they're going to look like the actual pdf document as well as editorial trace and then you're going to do author corrections either in a tabulated form or there's some real-time editing you can do online uh, depends on what the journal is but basically at this point it's already been accepted all you're doing is making sure that you don't have any additional mistakes in there and so it's really frustrating for me to go back and read an article 10 years ago and see something i did wrong so either don't read those articles or get it right the first time uh, it's totally up to you how you complete that all right and then you make all your changes to the to the proofs and edit the si and then ultimately submit it again and then it is accepted and so that closes out our journey a little bit over an hour i apologize for running late on that but again Writing a journal article is important. Here's the steps we went through, picking a journal, outlining the paper, doing figures, tables, graphs, and captions, then ultimately writing, um, editing, proofreading, and then submit, review, proofs, and the paper is done. And then you go back into the lab and start doing the cycle again, come up with an idea, get those experimental results, find a publishable result, and then start writing your paper. So with that, I will close here and I am happy to answer any questions. If you guys want to look up additional information, um, here's a bunch of references of people that are much more published than I am writing about these same exact things, figures, graphs, tables, uh, literature, um, just a few additional comments. No matter what you do, whether it's industry or academia or national lab or patent lawyer, writing is going to be a big part of your job. And the only way you're going to get good at it is by practicing. That's what it comes down to. And that practicing includes, you know, writing and iterating and reviewing, um, but also reading. And so even though you guys aren't going to write a paper for another year or so, some of the things I talked about are going to be embedded in your brain and you're going to start to see it in literature. And you're going to start to notice what a good paper is uh, versus a bad paper. And so again, it's, it's, it's an experiential thing. You have to spend time reading as well as writing. And after a while, you start to get a feel for what good and bad writing is and you can emulate the good and remove the bad.